Okay. Uh, so very grateful to be here and uh, be able to share our experiences um, with uh, what we have seen in the grid uh, with the very rapid increase uh, of wind power in Finland. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, Fin Grid is the uh, transmission system operator in Finland. And these challenges are, are interesting, let's say, uh, for us engineers uh, to solve how, how we can manage the going forward with even more renewables uh, connected to the grid. So let's look at the agenda for today. Uh, first, I will just give a very short introduction to to Fingrid, uh, the Finnish electricity system transition, uh, followed by by the challenges with grid following inverters, uh, mainly wind power that we have currently in the system. And then uh, going to benefits and applications of grid forming inverters with power will be uh, presenting and also the requirement for the grid forming best we have introduced in Finland. And we will uh, conclude with the uh, with a sum up of the presentation and the next steps that we are, we are taking in the grid forming journey. So we are not uh, presenting anything about what the grid forming technology, et cetera, is because you probably know it know it well uh, within the uh, control room and from the previous webinars and so on. But let's uh, look at first uh, where we come from. So Finland is in the Northern Europe. Um, and uh, our power system is uh, part of the Nordic synchronous region, which is interconnected also to the continental and UK system. Uh, but it's uh, uh, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Eastern Denmark uh, uh, are, are the same synchronous area. And uh, in the North, we have the uh, two, currently two, uh, 400 kV AC connections um, to Sweden. And then we have also 220 kV connection to Norway in the north. And on top of that, we have a HVDC connections in the south to central Sweden and to Estonia in the, in the, in the south coast as well. So Fingrid operates the 400 kV uh, grid, 220 kV grid, uh, and the half of the 110 kV sub transmission grid. And here you can see on the map the 400 kV grid. And uh, to kind of get the graph uh, about uh, how, how large the grid is, uh, the Finland is from uh, south to north, about 1,300 kilometers long, and, uh, uh, over 500 kilometers uh, wide. So uh, it's quite extensive grid, while we have a quite uh, low population of only 5.5 uh, million people. But the, if we look at the power system, it's uh, currently 40% uh, um, nuclear generation of the total gener yearly generation last year, 20% wind and solar, 20% hydro, and 20% biofuels, and other thermal. So the other thermal is about 5%. So it's already 95% carbon neutral generation in Finland. But we expect a lot of wind and solar, as I will show on the next uh, slide, because uh, the uh, other parts of the society are not yet uh, carbon neutral. So the industry, transportation, et cetera, it requires a lot of electrification. And that's why we expect a lot more uh, wind power, especially. And uh, the challenges we are seeing have been um, uh, mostly concentrated on, on the regions where we have very high penetration. So, so in, in the Finland, the wind power is concentrated on the on the west coast. Uh, hydropower is in the north, and then thermal power is, is located close to the consumption centers in the south. And if we look at the change in 
future, uh, future. So we just published uh, uh, the latest uh, lookout for how much uh, uh, new capacity is expected. And uh, currently we have uh, uh, about seven gigawatts of wind power installed. And that is expected to increase to 21 gigawatts by 2030. And, uh, and some over 10 gigawatts will be up to the, the, um, uh, the ones that are under construction already. We have agreement already. Uh, construction. And solar power is also picking up quite a lot, but uh, from, from energy wise, it's not that that big uh, uh, proportion of the wind power. Capacity wise, still quite a bit, even though we are in very north, where it's in the northern part of Finland, it's not even sun is not rising during the winter months. Uh, but what is this power? This, uh, I mean, increase in wind and solar causing is that the system situations are changing over a year. So uh, uh, the penetration, uh, hourly penetration of uh, wind and solar is, is uh, uh, here uh, presented as the direct duration curve on the, on the, over the year. So nowadays we have seen in the Nordic about uh, a little bit over 50% maximum penetration. But in the, on the Nordic level, it will increase uh, in, in our outlook to about uh, 80% by 2031, maximum penetration. And uh, as seen here on the, on the lower right side, uh, it is split between the regions quite unevenly. Um, so Finland is those uh, three uh, market modeling regions here that are uh, easternmost, and uh, we uh, have a quite a, a very high uh, expected to have like a, almost hundred percent penetration during the hour uh, in the northern part of Finland and Sweden. And in from Finnish perspective, we see in the Finnish subsystem that it will be operating uh, system where peak is like 90 percent uh, by 2031. Uh, so 90 percent produced by wind and solar. And uh, we have done uh, this kind of point of energy driven stability risk screening with, uh, with the uh, equivalent short circuit ratio since we started to see some uh, some issues with converter driven stability. And uh, as expected it it is where we have a lot of wind in power and basically no no almost no synchronous generation in that region at all and we are using this equivalent short circuit ratio as a as a risk analysis or uh, but it's uh, really seen that it's uh, not um, like an exact value but it's a good indicator of whether you might have some issues. And then we are running the studies on large scale EMT model. And if we jump to the, what kind of phenomena we have seen with pre following inverters, um, that uh, uh, with the very rapid increase of wind power, the, so um, first we started to see these low converter driven voltage oscillations. Uh, the first ones we were wearing like radially set small areas during outages. So, so uh, in places where normally the would be fed from another direction, and then you have a maybe quite large wind farm uh, that is uh, sort of then fed from another other other side in the sub transmission grid, and uh, and it started to um, oscillate. Basically, the voltage control was too aggressive. To those uh, new situations, and then we started to see this in in larger systems during out this in 2022. Uh, here we have a, the graph is from the west coast region. It's about 300 kilometers from the uh, the, the part where it was the uh, highest voltage oscillations. It's where about 
uh, if I remember correctly, they were they were close to ten kilovolt kilovolt the oscillations there, but it, here it's only only for show the measurement location. Uh, then we have also seen uh, loss of PLL uh, stability and active power oscillations in tripping of power plants. Uh, these, these have uh, happened in, in uh, regions where we have already been using actually the EMP simulations to set the curtailment limit um, for the wind power. But then there was a, a miscommunication of, uh, of the wind power control centers uh, between them and then uh, they kind of uh, let the took off the curtailment too early when there was still the, the outer sun going and the power power was then ramping up and we it started to oscillate and then it then the then it tripped. but it was really good actually for the purpose of um, uh, validating the EMT grid model so so we got really, really very, very nice match with the measurement. Then um, we have also uh, seen tripping of power plants in normal thought, uh, mainly due to the control or protection error. Uh, also seen sudden ramping of reactive power after grid fault. And this was due to kind of poor design of transit from mode to another. So, uh, there was a, something that it should have been changing from when you do, for example, voltage control mode uh, uh, change to reactive power mode, that it does a slow ramping, but it, uh, it was uh, in the control system, so that it also did it after the FRT. So it went to an FRT and it did it, but started to ramp it to, uh, to some, some, some other point that it should have done. So that's something that we have seen. And also rap rapid ramping of uh, uh, frequency and uh, rapid ramping to exceptionally high frequency and voltage in island link situation. Well, that's typical when you have a just grid following uh, uh, generation in the, in the, in the island or maybe. Uh, before the, then the protection fixed at all. Uh, and then we, to tackle these issues, what we have been doing is retuning the plant level controllers. That, that was the first step uh, because my, many of the issues were on the, on the voltage control uh, getting in an unstable when you, when you had all those uh, next to each other. Uh, so we updated the uh, well, control tuning guidelines uh, to account for the uh, other other power plants in the region. Then uh, we did update to the requirements, um, SSO damping production requirements. Now updating the overall the try through current input in overall this situation. Also now requesting the fast initial response from all this control, uh, which basically means uh, inverter terminal voltage control. Uh, we see that uh, that, uh, that improves the situation quite a bit. And then um, a new monitoring and control queue to the uh, control room. Uh, and it's possible to do more changes and curtailment uh, if there's a situation uh, for example, a forced outage, then we have been uh, that kind of uh, operation is needed. Now we are uh, currently building a synchronous condenser in the in the uh, West Coast region, which will be taken. Uh, we will start the commissioning test in the autumn, and uh, also now, uh, what uh, probably will present the grid forming. There's uh, requirements, and we are uh, um, going towards building SATCOMs. And uh, maybe later, then our, our plan is that we can introduce requirements to wind and solar power. So, 
hopefully as soon as possible with that. And from now here, I give it to Pauli. Thanks. Let me try to share my screen. Okay. Screen. Doesn't show, so maybe yeah. I'll probably share. I think we have the same issue we had earlier too. Okay, seems like there was the same issue that we had before. Yeah. And it crashed the Zoom. So maybe if Auntie can continue yeah, sharing. I will share. And it also dropped my video. So unfortunately, you can see, see me, but hopefully you can hear me cloud, uh, clear and, and loud. So yes, we can. Yeah, so I will just say next when it, I need you to click something. So please go ahead. Okay, so let's move towards to uh, the simulations that we have done and what we observe that would be the performance that we get from the grid forming in our network. So we have, a, a, as Antti mentioned, we have a PSCAT simulation model. Uh, and currently now we actually have a manufacturer specific uh, detailed models for each of our wind power plants. And now we have over, over uh, 6,000 megawatts of wind in the whole Finland, but we have the West Coast area, as Antti showed in the map, that's uh, quite lightly concentrated with the, with the wind. And in that area, we have almost 5,000 megawatts of wind at the moment. And we have that large scale model. And also we have made this more simplified model uh, to investigate different phenomena, and it it has around uh, three thousand megawatts of the of the wind. And first, let's go through some issues that we are now seeing with these models. So the first issue here that we can see are the reactive power oscillations after contingencies, and this is something that that Antti also sh showed a picture that wasn't only in a simulation, but we have a also measured and you're going to see that uh, in the figure you can see how is the voltage behaving uh, after a contingency and the second issue is that when we have a fault uh, let's say there's a three phase to ground fault in the system and the line disconnects we might lose a lot of lot of production in this simulation, we lose around uh, 500 megawatts of wind power plants, which is not desirable. But in the, on the other hand, in this case, it, it seems to stabilize the network a little bit. So not that high oscillations after that. And the third issue is the slow recovery, recovery from the fall try through mode. In this exact figure, you see that it is cycling uh, off from the fault right through mode and once back to the fault right through mode. And it, it takes a couple of cycles to, to break that. And then it, it gets back to the normal operation. But we can see that there are also some reactive power oscillations. And it's not only uh, the multiple cycles of this FLT mode uh, that is not uh, desirable, but from the first figure on the left side, you're going to see that. Uh, the power plants are coming really slowly out of the fault right through mode. And that is because the area is mainly consisting or, or barely consisting of grid following inverters. And if they are all on fault right through mode, what's going to bring the voltage up? So let's go to the next slide. 
And now uh, we have the same model. And now we see what is the effect of different compensation devices uh, for this, this fall. And each of these compensation devices are 200 MVA. So first is the two synchronous condensers. Of course, this is not grid forming, but this is the classical approach to this problem. Uh, we can see that uh, there is the, uh, with the two synchronous condensers, there's the fast comeback to the normal operation from the full try true mode. And it seems that the reactive power oscillations are damped quite well. And since now we are dealing with, with the reactive power oscillations, wouldn't it be uh, justified to have only grid following statcom to dampen that? And in our simulations, we see that, well, we can have really great voltage support and it brings the grid following inverters back from the fault try true mode really quickly, but there will be undamped oscillations after the contingency. And the third is the grid forming BES. Now we have two grid forming BES in the, in the area. And this seems to have a really good effect. The fault try true mode is, uh, we, we come back from that very quickly and the oscillations are really well damped. And then uh, is the last, last option is, is grid forming statcom and one synchronous condenser. And we can see that, that this also behaves really well. And this is actually uh, a solution that we went with in Fingrid, if you click next. Yes, so because we already had made investment decision on one synchronous condenser and we, we saw that we don't want to build a second synchronous condenser because we seem to get quite nice performance with the grid forming statcom and doesn't have as high losses and other mechanical stuff that we power engineers don't like that much. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is about the SSO damping of the grid forming. So our system, our, our west coast is, that has the high wind penetration, is in the middle of, of a serious compensated network. We have a quite high compensation degree of 75%. And in, in a contingency, the power can be fed almost through the serious uh, capacitors because there are only three 400 kV lines from the area. And in this simulation, uh, we had that three megawatts of wind consisting purely of uh, double fed induction generator wind turbines. And they were operated in a rather low wind scenario to excite the uh, SSCI. And it was around 34 Hertz, the mode. Uh, just press next. And just one second, yes. Uh, so we can see that uh, in the blue one, there is the original setup without any, any compensation devices. And we see that the damping is not that great. And then, on the green, we have a grid following statcom. And it seems that the oscillation, oscillation amplitude is even higher than with the original scenario. Uh, and all, I know that there is a possibility to tune the grid following statcom to have a good damping in a certain bandwidth of the SSO, but uh, it's not possible to have have that damp, dampen all the whole whole bandwidth that we want. And in the red curve, you can see that the grid forming controls. The SSO is really well damped.
So those were the simulations that we justify the need of the grid forming and what performance we are expecting it to have. And then let's jump to the grid forming best functional specification. So now we have announced the requirements for grid forming best and it is applicable to uh, type D, which is meaning over 30 megawatts or connection to over 110 kV. And it must be grid forming if it's connected to area with high penetration of, of, of converters, which is basically, if you are looking close future, all everywhere in Finland. So let's go first through the gener general stuff in the this functional specification. So the grid forming best will always be grid in grid forming mode, and we don't want it to cycle the grid following mode in any operation point. The second thing is that we are not requiring over, over dimensioning of the components. So uh, it will only go up to the greatest current. And third one is that it, it, shall, it shall be available in all state of charges, minimum and maximum. Well, this basically means that there will be a small buffer in, in both of these states. And also we do not wish to see similar uh, fault right through modes that there are with the grid following IBRs. We are relying on the physical, physical phenomena that is also same with the conventional rotating machines. And also we want the current limiting to be really carefully tuned so that it will maintain the grid forming performance when it's, uh, it has to limit the current. Okay, and then to the functionalities. So we are not defining any really strict uh, uh, func functionalities that it, it must must uh, like not uh, strict rise times or anything, but we will have it more like functional specification and we will adjust it project by project at this first phase. So first is the near instantaneous voltage and frequency support. We are expecting this to be a few milliseconds and we are expecting that the rise time would be under 10 milliseconds but this will be investigated case, case by case. And this means basically that it has the kind of internal voltage source behind impedance performance. And it shall have the active power response to the phase jump and also have really fast voltage uh, reaction to voltage uh, change. So it will increase the voltage stiffness also. Second one is the seamless transition between the islanded and grid connected operation. Uh, this means that if there, if it will be uh, in an island, then by by its technical capabilities, it, it will try to balance out the grid. And also, we require positive damping in this, this range. And this is meaning basically that it has the positive resistance uh, when, when you are observing a signal injection. And the last one here is the wall disbalancing. And this is something that we now expect to be in a normal operation. With the grid following, you know, requiring it in, in a fault conditions, but now it's in a normal operation also. But 
and this was the uh, original uh, requirements. And now that we have seen some customer projects launch launching up, uh, we will make a minor modifications that from the things that we have learned during these projects. So this will be updated this year. Okay, and in this, this, these new requirements, we also have quite large list of simulations that will be done in PSCAD and some also in, in the PSSC. And we require both models uh, from the grid forming applications. So I have picked a couple tests that, that might be of your interest. First is the phase jump test that, that is done to plus and minus 30 degrees. Uh, I've seen also uh, higher phase jumps like, like 60 degrees uh, in some requirements, but, but it seems that it can be difficult or close to impossible to uh, withstand that taking into account the, the physics of the system. And the second one is the combination of, of fault and voltage magnitude and the phase change. Uh, we have seen that this is hard for some, some machines like some if they are running virtual synchronous machine, this test can be quite difficult to, to pass. Third one is the loss of last synchronous generator. This is like the key test that now proves that the system is actually grid forming. This will be done so that there will be two duplicate models for this specific grid forming application that is in a project. And there, there will be also one parallel synchronous machine and they are feeding a load and then the synchronous machine is tripped. And what we want to see is that the uh, grid forming best will share the, share the load equally and the system will remain stable. And in our Nordic power system, we have inter-area oscillations between uh, South Finland and South Sweden. And this can be a limiting factor when we are exporting uh, to Sweden. And what we want to see that the grid forming BES is not amplifying the oscillations. And this can be done in, various may ways to prove that it's, it's damping this oscillation. It, one good way would be to, to inject these voltage oscillations behind a tethering impedance or and see if it's damping damping or not. This method that, that ha, we have seen that some some TSOs do and also we can do uh, some dynamic impedance scan and, and also observe these, these frequencies. And the next one is the actual dynamic impedance scan for between these frequency. And let's go to the next slide. Then also we introduced new kind of site tests and model validation with the grid forming. The first one is the phase jump test. And we are planning to do this by making a physical change to the grid topology. For example, disconnecting a line nearby the connection point by the fin grid operators or the DSO. Second one is physical island operation test. And in this test, the upstream breaker is opened and the BES will then is then left to supply a small load 
for example, it can be the house load of the power plant, or if there are other, other loads in the facility. Third one is the measurement of power quality. And this is just according to the IEC standard. And fourth one uh, is uh, we have announced this monitoring period after the grid code tests. So after the grid normal commissioning tests are done, the grid forming best shall be monitored at least 30 days. And we have requirements for the monitoring accuracy that is higher than usual. And after this period, the performance shall be reported to us. And also we will select the most significant disturbance during this period. And the simulation models shall be validated against this disturbance by using a playback simulation. And then let's go to the concl con conclusions and next steps. And will you take it from here? Yeah. So uh, to conclude, uh, just um, as we as I explained, uh, the high share of grid polarimeters has introduced a uh, new kind of challenges to the Finnish system. And um, as one of the solutions uh, in simulations, grid forming controls have shown very uh, good performance in improving stability with this, uh, within this region. And we have been running these, uh, these simulations with uh, multiple manufacturer models. And, um, and even though there's different kind of uh, performance, uh, we can see that it's very promising. And due to the Due to the fact that it seems very, very good, we, we have now gone forward with introducing this uh, grid forming um, capabilities. With uh, We are in the process of acquiring two statcoms, um, which are 300 megawatts each. But these are actually now without additional energy buffers. So that's uh, the only day what's in, in the platform. A capacitor, so there's no ultra cap or anything included, but it's uh, with the new type of control, grid forming control, which is faster. And the first one is planned to be taken in operation in 2027. Uh, now, we, as uh, Pauli showed, we also now require grid forming operation from new best connections that are connecting with the uh, converter dominated parts of grid. And the first project with the GFM control will be taken into operation uh, next spring. So we are in the process of, uh, of going through uh, the requirements with the, the, the manufacturers that are delivering, delivering those projects. So I hope you enjoyed our presentation and got something, uh, some uh, ideas from it, uh, maybe questions that you want to discuss with it. With us. So thank you very much for listening. Yes, thank you very much on my behalf also. I see that there are some questions in the chat.